was that? Am I on now? Yes, I can hear myself now. All right. So that uh, Hudson Elms ministry has been moved to March the 24th. Ladies, remember the Grounded and Growing Women's Conference coming up here in April, April 13th. Uh, there's a page in the bulletin dedicated to that, and you can find the information there. Uh, thank you to those of you who have given to the Piano Fund. Uh, we're about halfway there and paying for that, so uh, we really appreciate that. You can see those financial details in the bulletin. Uh, let me remind you of our upcoming special series starting on Easter Sunday, uh, the three crucial questions series, did Jesus rise from the dead, is Jesus God, and is Jesus the only way to heaven? This is a series that is both apologetic in nature that will help you in understanding and defending the faith, but also evangelistic in nature. We want to invite our unsaved uh, family and friends and neighbors to come in for this series. So we have flyers available for you on the table in the narthex. You can pick those up, take them, give those out. They're a good reminder for folks. And uh, you could give out some in your neighborhood. Uh, this starting today is being uh, widely distributed in newspapers in the area. This is in the Kent paper today. And then we'll be in the Hudson paper the following uh, three weeks. Uh, so let's really be in prayer for this series of messages. And then finally, I would remind you of our evening service at 6 o'clock. Pastor Salinas preaching through Paul's letter to the Colossians. And this evening, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. So let me encourage you to be here tonight at 6 o'clock. Let's now take a few moments as we prepare our hearts for worship. The psalmist said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I'd ask you to stand this morning for our call to worship from the word of God, a responsive reading from Psalm 145. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. To make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Let's sing together hymn 103, please. Hymn 103, Holy God, we praise your name.
Good morning. It's really, really good to be here, to be home. And uh, let's worship the Lord together. Join me now as I pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today. We thank you so much for this Lord's Day. We pray that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would come down and reveal yourself to us. Teach us through your word what you would have us to learn today. And I pray that our worship would be pleasing in your sight, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you will turn over to the next page, we will read the Nicene Creed together. It's printed in your bulletin. Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was in incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. That is Christianity. I'm thankful we believe this. We have something to, to believe in. Here now our bidding to repentance. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins for your name's sake. Now we will sing together as a prayer of confession, hymn number 488.
that is your prayer of confession, hear now the good news, the assurance of pardon. Who was a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. If you would now please turn to the next page in your worship folders. Please stand. Let's sing together, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. Please be seated. There are a number of you who will remember John and Larissa Key, who were here for about a year or so with us. John was an intern after graduating from seminary, and he now pastors Providence Reformed Church, a PCA congregation in Bakersfield, California. Uh, John and Larissa send their greetings to Grace Church. Uh, they would appreciate your prayers. They are now expecting their second child, so we're excited about that. Uh, but if you would also pray for the congregation there, John's clerk of session, a gentleman named Michael, uh, has uh, suffered a return of cancer. And uh, so there are several uh, challenges uh, there, and uh, I know the Keys would really appreciate your prayers. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and let's all pray together. Our most gracious and loving and kind Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the return of your day. We are so thankful, Lord, for the privilege of gathering with your people. We thank you, Lord, for your church. We thank you for the gift of worship, of praise, of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, for your holy word that we can read and study together. As we bow before you this morning, O Lord, we confess with the Apostle Paul, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. Lord, we know that 
It is from this mystery which all true godliness springs. The mystery that God was manifest in the flesh. Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming into this world to live for us, to die for us. But we thank you, Lord, you were not only manifested in the flesh to live and to die, but you have been vindicated by the Spirit, raised again from the dead and seen by angels. Your gospel has been proclaimed throughout the nations. It's been believed on throughout this world. You, O Lord, were taken up in glory and you rule and reign now over all creation. You rule and reign as the head of your church. And for that, we give you our thanks and praise. We come as your church, depending entirely upon you. We come in our weakness and with our needs, and we seek you for your grace. This morning, O Lord, we pray for our family of the week, how we thank you for John and for Ruth. Lord, we thank you for bringing them to Grace Church. We pray that you will sustain them and sustain their health during this cold and flu season. Lord, we pray for Joanna, who is juggling a busy schedule of work and school. We thank you for Joanna. We thank you for her calling to serve you at Ligonier Ministries. And we pray for her studies at Reformation Bible College. Lord, you've been so good to us to bring this dear family into our lives. We thank you for it. Father, we pray for others during this cold and flu season, as many are sick and under the weather, would you grant strength and healing. Father, we continue to pray for those who have struggled with various health concerns. We mentioned today our brother Calvin and our sister Betty and Ron and Doris's daughter Lynn. We continue to pray for little Stella. And Father, we also want to remember the Andrusk family this week as they have a court date for obtaining adult guardianship for Chris. Lord, we know that this will be a good thing for Chris and for his future. We pray that there would be no difficulties in this process and that they would be best suited and best placed to be able to meet his future needs. Lord, we remember Paul and Chris again this morning as they continue to face a number of losses in their family. The loss of Paul's sister Sally, Chris's stepmother Donna, and now Paul's cousin Dennis. Lord, this has been one blow after another to this family. And we know that they depend upon you. We know that your grace is evident in their lives and only by your grace are they going through this very difficult time we pray for you to continue to sustain them and lord may our love and our prayers be there as a support father we do want to pray for our elders this week for them and for their wives Thank you for these men, those active on the session and those inactive who serve in various ways. We thank you for raising up godly men to help lead the congregation and to guide it. We know, O oh Lord, that there are sacrifices involved in this, not only for them, for their time and their energy, but for their wives and families as well. Lord, we thank you for those who are willing to make these sacrifices for the good of your church. And we pray that you would bless them for that. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would guide these men as they seek to serve you and seek the leading of the Spirit for the work of the ministry here. We pray for our missionaries of the week, Josh and Ashley, who serve you with RUF at Queen's University. Thank you for that evangelistic and discipleship ministry and we pray that you would bless it at Queens that they would see many students come to faith in Jesus 
Remember our brothers and sisters today at Heights Presbyterian in Cleveland and Pastor Davis. We pray for their intern, Ted, as he continues his seminary studies and seeks to discern your will for him for the future and church planting. We pray for the current leadership training that you would raise up elders and deacons for that congregation to faithfully serve you there. We pray for their community dinners as they seek to reach out with the gospel to those around them. And Father, we also would ask you for a long-term permanent space for them to meet and worship. Remember, Lord, our PCA Agency of the Week, the Committee on Discipleship Ministries. We thank you for Dr. Eastock who leads that work. We thank you for the tools that are published for both children and adult in their education. And we pray, Lord, for the books and materials, all the study aids that come from CDM, that they'll be used for building up the church. Do remember, Lord, our sister churches in various places. We pray today for Providence in Bakersfield, for Pastor Key, for Elder Michael, who is suffering from cancer. Lord, would you encourage that congregation at this time? Would you heal uh, this dear brother? We would remember today our sister congregations in Scotland. We think of Berghead Free Church and the ministry of Peter Turnbull and of Brian Roby, of Lock Guilford, and Lord, the work there of Roger Crooks and the need for elders in that local congregation. Lord, provide for these dear brothers and sisters. We would also ask for ourselves this morning in our upcoming series of messages as we begin Holy Week next week and remember Palm Sunday and your triumphal entry, Lord Jesus, as we seek to proclaim the gospel in its fullness we pray that you will bring people in under the sound of your word. Lord, use each and every one of us to invite folks into these services. Lord, help me as I prepare and study to preach these messages. Father, open hearts. We long to see conversions. We long to see, Lord, men and women and children come to a living faith in Jesus. Father, have mercy upon us in our nation at this time. We pray for our leaders, for all those in positions of authority over us, that we might lead quiet and peaceful lives, that we may maintain the freedoms of worship, that we may live in ways that are dignified and upright. And that you would get glory for your name in this nation once again. Lord, in days gone by, you have moved mightily by your Spirit in very dark hours. You have poured out your Spirit to stir up your church, to awaken your church, and to awaken the lost. And we simply ask that you would do it again for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'll ask the ushers, please, to come for our offering. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will be exceeding glad. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will be exceeding glad.
Father, we are so grateful for the privilege, for the opportunity to share in the work of the ministry through our gifts. Accept our praise and accept these gifts. Please be seated. And we are going to read in the Old Testament this morning from the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, one of the more well-known passages in this prophecy, chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And let's hear now the word of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. And blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land and though a tent remain in it it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled the holy seed is its stump and now in the New Testament, we're reading once again Revelation chapter 15. Revelation 15. We've made some progress through this book. We're a little over two thirds of the way through. We're taking a break, of course, coming up with Holy Week and the special series of messages, but. Uh, We'll, we'll get there, Lord willing, in the end. Maybe the new heavens and new earth before we get to chapter 22, uh, but we'll get there in the end. Revelation 15, let's read from verse 1. John writes, Then I saw another angel in heaven, great and amazing, or excuse me, sign in heaven great and amazing seven angels with seven plagues which are the last for with them the wrath of God is finished and I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands and they sing the song of Moses the servant of God and the song of the lamb saying Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, 
I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. This is God's living and inerrant word. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but this word stands forever. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before you once again, we ask that you would help us to see great truths in your word. We ask that you would help us to think great thoughts about you. We pray, O oh Lord, that the knowledge of you will change us, that it will transform us, that we will be built up in our most holy faith and that we will live for your glory and honor. And we ask all of this in Christ's precious and powerful name. Amen. What was your favorite part of elementary school? Was it a teacher who made learning just so much fun? Uh, maybe it was a particular class. You loved music or you loved art or those really cool science experiments. Maybe your favorite part of elementary school was recess. I know that was certainly uh, near the top of my list. But without a doubt, my most favorite thing in elementary school was show and tell. I loved show and and tell. It was always so much fun. Whether uh, your classmates brought an interesting insect they had found in their backyard, or maybe it was a cool new birthday present, whatever it was, uh, they would bring it, they would show it to you, they would tell you all about it, and it was fascinating. I loved show and tell. And it was always in that order, wasn't it? Show and tell. Now, the Apostle John certainly knew about show and tell because throughout this book, God has revealed to him vision after vision. And through verbal revelation, he has given him explanation after explanation, showing him and telling him about his plan for the ages. And when we come to chapter 15... We have a prime example of God doing just that. A prime example of show and tell, except in Revelation 15, John reverses the order. Here, it isn't show and tell, but rather tell and show. Revelation 15 is the introduction to the seven bowl judgments. The seven bowls of God's wrath, the final climactic judgments that bring history to an end. And this introduction to the bowl judgments falls into two main sections. We looked at the first one last time in verses 1 through 4, where the focus is on the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. As God prepares for these last, these consummative judgments, his people pick up the themes of the Exodus and they begin to sing of God's glorious power. Great and amazing are your ways, O Lord. 
great and powerful, righteous and holy is your salvation. And they celebrate the victory of God just as the Lord triumphed over Pharaoh and his forces, just as he brought his people out of the land of Egypt and drowned his enemies in the depths of the sea, so God, at the consummation of history, has saved a people. He will have redeemed his chosen ones, and they will stand victorious and secure in him forever and forever. Now this morning we are coming to the second section, the second half of this introduction. And John here picks up on the words of verse 1 where we were introduced to this other sign, this great and amazing sign in heaven. And he explains further for us the details. But in this passage, John doesn't hear any voices that are singing. The Lord does not speak to him in any way with words of explanation. He's already been told of God's great and amazing power. And now he is going to be shown that power in these final verses. How does the Lord do that? How does he show to John? How does he show to us? How does God reveal? How does God demonstrate the execution of his climactic judgments? Well, he does so in this passage in three ways. God is going to perform his climactic judgments in three ways. Look with me at these verses. First of all, in verses 5 and 6, the Lord judges in keeping with his covenant. He judges in keeping with his covenant. When the sanctuary in heaven is open, John could see that God is carrying out these last judgments in keeping with his covenant law. His covenant law. After this I looked and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open. We've had glimpses into this heavenly sanctuary prior to this, especially in chapter 4. We actually get a bit more of a glimpse there. We get some detail as John is taken up into the heavens to see the throne room of God. But here, there is a unique description of this sanctuary. John uses a title here in verse 5 that occurs nowhere else in the book of Revelation. He calls this the sanctuary of the tent of witness. Now, this description links the vision of heaven with the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that really should come as no surprise to us because we're told when Moses is given those instructions for the tabernacle in Exodus that he is to build it according to the pattern revealed to him. And then in the book of Acts chapter 7 and in Hebrews chapter 8, we're told that that pattern of the earthly tabernacle was structured after the pattern of heaven itself. The earthly abode of God in the midst of the children of Israel was to be a lesson to them. It was to be an example to them of what God was like, what his abode was like in heaven. And it's called here the tent of witness. Although I actually prefer the way the updated NIV translates this. It says the tabernacle of the covenant law. The tabernacle of the covenant 
law. Think about that tabernacle for a moment. It housed the law of God. In that inner sanctuary, the holy of holies, there stood the Ark of the Covenant. And within that Ark, the sacred law of God, written on tablets of stone with the very finger of God as a revelation of his character, as a revelation of his moral nature and of his absolute standards for mankind. Yes, it was a summary of his covenant with Israel, but the Ten Commandments that we refer to as the moral law of God reflect for us what he is like and what he requires of everyone. Now, I believe that perhaps the very best summary of the doctrine of God's law occurs in our own Westminster Confession of Faith. In chapter 19, paragraph 5, for example, it refers to these Ten Commandments, and it says, The moral law doth forever bind all not just the children of Israel, but it forever doth bind all, as well the justified, the saved, as others, the lost as well, to the obedience thereof, and that not only in regard to the matter contained in it, but also in respect to the authority of God, the creator who gave it. Neither doth Christ in the gospel any way dissolve, but much strengtheneth this obligation the moral law of God first given in essence to Adam in the garden as God demanded his obedience written on the heart of man in creation now written on stone and revealed to his chosen nation is the standard for all mankind Now, the next paragraph in the confession, paragraph 6 of chapter 19, goes on to describe the uses of the law of God. And there are three of them. You, You see, God's law is like a mirror. It reflects who God is. We we can see the nature of God in his law. But God's law is also like a pair of handcuffs. Yeah, because it restrains evil. I don't know if you are a YouTube devotee, but if you ever bring up YouTube, you'll find often that there are police videos on there. Police chases and arrests and shootings, and it's all pretty dramatic. And when they arrest a bad guy, they put the cuffs on him. Now, putting on those cuffs does nothing to change that criminal's heart. But it does restrict his behavior. And the law of God is like that. Paul makes it clear in Romans 8 that the law cannot change our hearts. Only the gospel can transform us. But when we hear the law and we we see the, the condemnation that comes with breaking the law, Uh, there can be a restraining force that says we do not want to face those consequences. But the law is not only like a mirror and like a pair of handcuffs, it's also a guidebook. Because you see, the law reflects and restrains, but it also reveals God's pattern and desire for our lives. How are we to live? We're to live in obedience to his commandments. Now, those are the three uses of this covenant law for us, but as the tabernacle of the tent of witness in heaven is opened up, we are reminded that there is a fourth use of the law, a use that pertains to God himself. Because you see, this law is also a ruler it's a measuring stick it is a 
standard by which he will judge everyone on the last day. Hebrews chapter 2 says, We must pay close attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Listen to those words again. Every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. That means, folks, that God doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't overlook sin. Not mine and not yours. And when he brings history to an end, and when he sets up beside each human being the measuring rod of his holy commandments, how will you stand? If you try to stand by yourself and say, well, I've not, I've not been as bad as so-and-so, it'll be a complete failure and disaster. The only way to stand up to the measuring rod of God is to stand in Christ, the law keeper. To stand in Christ, the one who obeyed perfectly. The one who was born of a woman made under the law to redeem us who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. The only hope on the day of judgment is to have obeyed that law perfectly. And if you haven't done that, then you must be united to someone who has. And that person is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And you must be united to Him by faith. Because you see, God will judge in keeping with His covenant law. But we see here in verse 6 that God will also judge in keeping with his covenant curses. If Exodus 20 and the giving of the Ten Commandments is the background for verse 5, then Leviticus 26 is the background for verse 6. In that chapter, we have a very similar pattern to what we find later in the book of Deuteronomy. Blessings promised for obedience and curses for disobedience. For example, in Leviticus 26, verses 3 and 4, the Lord says, If you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, then I will give you rains in their season, and your land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Blessing, blessing, blessing for those who obey. But, verse 14, If you will not listen to me, and will not do all these commandments if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments, then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consumes the eyes. I will set my face against you and you shall be struck down before your enemies. There's blessing for obedience. But there are severe consequences for disobedience. Now I want you to note here two things about these curses. God inflicts them through his heavenly messengers whom he describes in verse 6 as clothed in linen, clean and bright to reflect the holiness and the purity of God. But then there's that curious addition to this description. They have a golden sash across their chests. One other time you see that in Revelation. It's all the way back in chapter 1, verse 13. Christ wears the golden sash as well. 
And so these angels emerge from the sanctuary, clothed as priests, reflecting the purity and the beauty of Christ, our great high priest. And they come as the agents of the curses of God. But then I also want you to see that, that God inflicts this curse sevenfold. There, there are seven angels who are going to be given seven bowls. And in Leviticus 26, God says, if in spite of all these threats, if you will not listen to me, then I will discipline you again sevenfold for your sins. Verse 21, then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will you striking you sevenfold for your sins. Now when you put verses 5 and 6 together, you will see that God is not haphazard in his judgment. He is not capricious. He is not careless. He has a standard. And he will stick to it. Now for those who are not in Christ, that should strike terror in the heart. It should strike terror in the heart of those all those who are lost. But for us as believers, this truth, this reality is also a, a source of comfort and encouragement. Because if God judges in keeping with his covenant, then it means that God judges in faithfulness to all he has said and all that he has promised. God can be trusted. He will be faithful to his word. Now, we can see on, on a human level how important that is. We can see the importance of faithfulness and consistency within the family. Uh, children need consistency, right? And that's one of the great ways for parents to build trust. Kids aren't going to like it when mom and dad stick to their guns. They're going to balk at that. They're going to whine. They're going to cry. They're going to fuss. But over time, that consistency will tell the child that mom and dad are reliable. I can bank on what they have to say. They're not wishy-washy. They'll stick to their guns. I once knew a father who was really quite bizarre in the way he treated his children and the way he disciplined them. A minor infraction, I, I mean something that at the very most uh, would, would require maybe a, a slight rebuke. Now, don't do that again. It would bring down the wrath of his fury a small matter. And yet there would be major things that would happen that, that needed some very direct disciplinary intervention. And he would say, now honey, that's not very sweet, is it? And that would be the end of it. And, and, and the children, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know if, if something big would be okay. I, I can get away with murder here. But if I look cross-eyed at my baby sister, I'm, I'm in for the death penalty practically. It, it was erratic. It was bizarre. And it had an effect on the children. But God isn't like that, is he? He's never like that. He is consistent and therefore can be trusted in all that he says and in all that he does, even when he must condemn. The Lord judges in keeping with his covenant. But you'll see here in the second place, in verse 7, that the Lord judges in answer to our prayers. 
Now, to understand the way the vision uh, demonstrates this particular point, we have to examine, first of all, these golden bowls. One of the living creatures coming out of the sanctuary gives these seven golden bowls to the seven angels. Now, this is not the first time in Revelation that we've encountered golden bowls. They first appear back in chapter 5 and in verse 8. And there we read that when the Lamb had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, they fell down before the Lamb. These creatures and these elders, they had harps and they had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, the very next reference to these here in chapter 15 where we are told they are filled with the wrath of God now if we're going to be good students of the Bible if we're going to be faithful interpreters we have to compare scripture with scripture and when we do that this may appear to at best lead to some confusion or or at worst a contradiction Uh, what's in these bowls what are they filled with intercessions or or indignation and the answer is both both because you see these golden bowls teach us a golden lesson that is that God will bring forth his final day of wrath and justice in answer to the prayers of his people We see that not only in the bowls of chapter 5 and of chapter 15. But sandwiched between these two passages is another very interesting part of John's vision in chapter 8. When another angel came and stood at the altar and he was given a golden censer and much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints. And so the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose up before God. And then what did the angel do? The angel then took his censer and he filled it with fire from the altar and he threw it down to the earth. And when he did, there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Watch the directions. The prayers of God's saints ascend to the throne and judgment is hurled down on the earth. Now, when we come to this 15th chapter, this is now the third time the Lord has emphasized this point in the book. He keeps repeating himself. He repeats himself because he wants to emphasize the role of prayer, the role that prayer plays on the final day of justice, and he wants to encourage us to be persistent, therefore, in praying for God's day of justice. This was Jesus' purpose in telling the parable of that widow who pestered the judge in Luke 18. One of my favorite parables of Jesus. There was a judge in a certain city and he didn't fear God and he couldn't care less about the people around him. He was a selfish brute of a man. And there was a poor widow. And she kept coming to him and she kept saying, give me justice from my adversary. Give me justice from my adversary. And finally, the judge was just fed up with it. Get this woman off my back, he said. I don't care about God. I don't care about her. But she's driving me crazy. And he says, I'm going to give her justice. Now, Jesus told that parable because our God is not like that judge. Our God will give justice, Jesus says, and he will give it speedily. 
But the Savior concludes that parable with this question. Nevertheless, despite the fact that God will give justice, despite the fact that he will give it to those who ask, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? What is the chief expression of faith? Calvin defines it as prayer. Prayer. That's how we say we're trusting in God. And so the question is this morning, men and women, when Christ returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will he find us faithful in crying out for his justice and for the vindication of his church? When Jesus returns, will he find us persistently praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? There's no doubt about it when we look around us that the world has gone mad. There is no doubt about it that as David said in Psalm 12, wickedness is exalted on every hand. What's going to put that right? What's going to take this upside down world and turn it right side up again? A revised budget? Our politicians seem to think that if we just throw money at things, we can solve them. How's that working out for us? Is it legislation? Well, we've already seen that if God's law cannot change the heart of an individual, how much less can human legislation do that? Programs? Can we program ourselves into sanity once again? Hardly. This upside down world will be turned right side up in divine intervention, through divine intervention, in answer to prayer. And so we pray for God's mercy. We pray for revival. We pray for conversions. But we also pray, come, Lord Jesus, and take your waiting church home. And the Lord, who judges in keeping with his covenant, judges in answer to our prayers. But there's one final way that God will execute his climactic justice at the end of time, and you see that in verse 8, where the Lord judges in his glorious power. When the angels come out of the sanctuary, we are told in verse 8 that the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. In this final scene of this introduction. The emphasis on God's glorious power in judgment becomes evident when we see what occurs in the tabernacle. First, the sanctuary is filled with smoke. Not, not unlike instances in the Old Testament. For example, when Moses set up the tabernacle in the wilderness, that Shekinah glory cloud filled it when Solomon dedicated the temple in 1 Kings chapter 8, the priest came out and the glory of God came in. John's experience is not unlike that of Isaiah. When the seraphim cried out in chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory and then we're told the foundations of the threshold shook and the voice of him who called at that voice and the house was filled with smoke. Here we see in the most dramatic fashion that the holiness of God stands behind all of these events. 
the smoke of his presence proceeding from his glory proceeding from his majesty proceeding from the glorious splendor of his very being and his sovereign omnipotent might and what happens as a result of this house being filled with the smoke it becomes inaccessible no one can enter why is that? Because these acts of judgment are too horrible. They're too much for any mere mortal to bear or witness. Remember the words of Malachi when he promised that the messenger of the covenant was coming. The Lord that you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in Oh, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he is revealed? Because he's like a refiner's fire. No one can enter the tabernacle. No one can enter the tabernacle because this work of God is not to be interrupted. The Lord will thoughts on that day. He will not renege. He will not change his mind. He will stick to his guns. Isaiah 14, in describing the work of God, asks, who can annul it? Or when God stretches out his hand, who can turn it back? No one can enter the sanctuary when it is filled with this smoke because God alone is the judge oh oh, it's true that he uses means it's true that he has agents but divine judgment is the prerogative of the Lord himself he takes the initiative He is in control. And with this sanctuary inaccessible, there is no access to the mercy seat. The day of opportunity has come to an end. There's no more chance to plead for God's grace There's no more atonement to be offered. There's no more hope. Just the fearful cries of the rich and the poor, the king and the commoner, the young and the old, for the rocks and the mountains to hide them from the lamb and his wrath. I always loved show and tell. But this tell and show is terrifying, to say the least. Oh oh yes, there's encouragement here to, to know that God is faithful to all of his covenant promises. Uh, Yes, there's encouragement here for us to be persistent in prayer because God answers prayer and we'll see the ultimate answer when Jesus returns. But in the end, this vision leaves us overawed at the majesty and at the holiness and at the power of God. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Because when you are overwhelmed with God in this way, then that generates within you a reverence for the great judge. 
that generates within your heart a true fear of God? And brothers and sisters, when you fear God, that will change the way you look at everything else. Let's pray. Father, our appropriate reaction ought to be trembling. Like the thresholds of the temple that shook when the seraphim cried out. Work within us, O Lord, the fear of you. Change, O Lord, our outlook on everything else through this sight of you. Work within us that holy reverence, which is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 66. Hymn number 66. And I will ask you to to stand and sing in response to God's word. God is known among his people. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.